Hey, this is Kevin Kelly, and you are listening to the Stardom Cast. This is Jesse from Club Venus from Stardom, and you're watching Stardom Cast. Welcome to the Stardom Cast, your weekly audio source of all things World Wonder Ring Stardom, a brand new retrospective where we delve into the rich and varied history of World Wonder Ring Stardom. I'm your host, Rob Goodwin, and I'm joined as ever by Mr. Matt Turner. Matt Turner, how the devil are you, good sir? Rob Goodwin, I am fantastic. I am doing well. It's a beautiful beautiful day here in the uh, northeastern Pennsylvania area. We're in the midst of a heat wave. We've got a little bit of a cool breeze going and uh, always excited to talk to you about really about anything, to be honest with you. I think me and you can talk about paint dry and we can keep it entertaining, but obviously great to talk about stardom and great to talk about one of my favorite wrestlers of all time in stardom and somebody that is really a hot topic when it comes to professional wrestling right now and one Saya Kamatani. But brother, enough about me. How's everything over there in the land of the birth of Black Sabbath? Yeah, it's not too bad. I'm sweating cobs at the moment. It is very, very warm in this podcast room, which apparently doesn't breathe too well, but I also don't want to have the window open whilst I shout pay-per-view names because our new neighbours might think I'm a smidgen odd. But other than that, I am doing very, very well. Coming off a just a emotionally draining week, in stardom in terms of pay-per-views obviously we have already released our review of <clears throat> the conversion and new blood 13 um and that will be in of course the podcast archive episodes but matt you're absolutely right saika matani is a name that is on almost every single stardom fan's lips unfortunately for all the wrong reasons it seems i disagree and obviously we're recording this on a tuesday tomorrow we will be doing our review of <clears throat> The Conversion, and that'll be, obviously, you'll be hearing the Stardom cast before you hear this episode, but uh, everybody's upset, and um, I understand the reason why. However, if you're a fan of Saya Kamatani, like I am, obviously, there's a this is the breakdown before the massive, massive buildup, or, are you ready for this one, Rob? The massive, massive rise of the Golden Phoenix. It could be. It could well be. It's it's certainly been a turbulent couple of weeks for Sayak Amatani and, of course, for Queen's Quest, which is technically still in existence, but only has one member. However, Matt, in this latest retrospective, we're not talking about current stardom, obviously, because that's what is implied by the word retrospective. We're delving deep into Sayak Amatani's history to her breakout year 2021 and to her Cinderella tournament victory in 2021, looking at that run through the tournament that eventually saw her crowned the Cinderella tournament victor. Matt, what sort of memories do you have of this tournament and of Saya's victory overall? I actually, when I just first started watching Stardom, it was right towards the, right when um, this show first aired because I just got into Stardom. Stardom had a lot of buzz in 16, 17, 18 because of Mayu, Io, and Kyrie. And then with the buzz of Sherry versus Utami, which was obviously the main event of the final, Saya's final two matches. So I actually, when I first watched the show, maybe two and a half years ago, I forgot about Saya's first two round matches with Tam and Starlight Kid, which we'll get into it. But I remember her just having a phenomenal final night, having to defeat tag team partners and stable mates in Micah and Himika. And what a story that is to tell, the fact that she has to go through two, ta two tag partners to get the Cinderella tournament, to win the Cinderella tournament. So ultimately, when you go back and watch this, which again, I watch all four of these matches, 
matches probably within three days of each other, you can make an argument that this is the greatest Cinderella run in the history of the tournament. And again, wrestling is subjective. You can like what you like. What we saw with Han and especially the booking on Han and, and the 2024 Cinderella tournament just a few months ago is stellar. Arisa Hoshinki's run was really, really good as well. A um, lot of really good Cinderella tournament winners. But this, for me, going back and watching it, and again, the four stars that she defeated in this tournament, Tam Nakano, future Red Belt winner, Micah, future Red Belt winner, Starlight Kid, prime for big things in stardom. Uh, Himika is obviously retired, but obviously she's made it to the finals of the five-star Grand Prix the year before. It really is a tough road for Sayakama Tani to go through, but what an absolute fantastic tournament win for her. And then I just watched something... Uh, maybe about seven or eight months ago, like a backstage thing with Shuri and Utami when obviously they have that double knockout match that goes well over 40 minutes, the highest rated match, women's match in the history of the Wrestling Observer, which Utami, as she's coming out exhausted, she sees Saya in the dress for the first time and was like, oh my God, like you look terrific. Congratulations on the tournament win. Congratulations on, uh, you know, a great match. And it's just, it's just so heartwarming to see the two of them just how entrenched they were in the Aphrodite tag team and uh, obviously Queen's Quest. So what's, uh, you know, all together in a big bow, Sayaka Matani, and we mentioned on this podcast so many times before, one of the most lovable wrestlers in all of wrestling, just one of the best pure baby faces that she might not be everybody's favorite wrestler, but there's nobody that's like, yeah, I, I don't care too much for Sayaka Matani. Everybody loves her or she is your favorite wrestler. And this wrist tournament really is the springboard for her to eventually get that white belt and go on to have, in my opinion, the greatest run as Wonder of Stardom champion. And in my opinion, one of the greatest championship runs of any wrestling company, of any champion over the last 20, 25 years. I think something with Sayaka Matani is you don't feel like anything's forced with her. And what I mean by that is that in terms of baby faces, there are very few who are as effortlessly endearing as Sayaka Matani is. You could say that obviously Mayu Iwatani is sort of in a class of her own in terms of baby face. She could do whatever she wanted and she'd still be a baby face. She could set fire to the ring and she'd still be a baby face. Um, but Sayaka Matani, it doesn't feel like she's trying to get people to like her. It just feels that this is just her herself and because that's how it feels it's very easy to get behind her and because of that it was apparent to a lot of people not me because i once again predicted a completely different person to win the tournament azumi who never ever wins the bloody tournament um but she was a lot of people's pick for this and obviously this comes off the back of stardom already showing a huge amount of trust in sayaka matani who only debuted in the company in 2019 and yet in March 2021 it was her that was put in this red belt match in Nippon Budokan against Utami Hayashista so a lot of trust was already invested in Sayaka Matani and I will be honest she surpassed my wildest expectations in that match and that was the real moment that I took up sat and took notice of Sayaka Matani and thought, Jesus, she could be the top person in this company. Um, uh, and then obviously the Cinderella tournament happened, um, which was the following month. And just for those who are brand new listeners, because we do have new listeners every single week, and hello to you all, thank you for listening. Um, and to those who have listened before, thank you for staying. Um, but in terms of people who are new to Storm, just a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of factual information regarding the Cinderella tournament. It's Stardom's single elimination tournament initially, the entire tournament was completed on a single night in April inside Corican Hall with 10-minute time limits on the matches. You could win via pinfall, via submission, or via over-the-top rope elimination as well. It's run in one form or another since 2015 when it was called the Cinderella Champions Fiesta. Um, the first tournament was won by Mayu Iwatani. There have been eight winners of the tournament so far, with only two having ever won the tournament twice, the aforementioned Maya Iwatani and Mirai, both of whom not only won the tournament twice, but won the tournament back-to-back. -back. So Maya Iwatani won the tournament in both 2015 and 2016, and then Mirai won it in 2022 and 2023. 
The winners of the tournament are granted a wish, which manifests as a title shot. It has only ever been a title shot, and it is ordinarily for the white belt. That this isn't exclusively for the white belt. There have been three challenges for the red belt. For those that have won the uh, Cinderella tournament, all of those have been unsuccessful, however. Um, and of the remaining seven shots, all of them have gone for the white belt, but only four of them have been successful. So uh, getting the Cinderella dress and the crown, not necessarily um, uh, a shoe in to get a tournament, uh, sorry, a championship victory with a success period of only 40%. Obviously, the last winner of the tournament in 2024 was Hannon, who went on to have a fantastic match with Sioriano um, uh, at Flashing Champions, but uh, sorry, at All-Star Grand Queendom, but was unfortunately unsuccessful there. Um, the 2021 tournament, actually, that we are going to be talking about today was the first tournament that spanned more than one night. Now, remember, Matt, the, there was a little bit of backlash in regards to that because the Cinderella tournament, part of its charm was that it was one night, that it all happened on one night. And the argument was that spanning it over more than one night, where, you know, this one was, I think, over technically over four but there were some matches on different nights as well so i think technically it was over maybe five maybe even six um but it robbed it a little of its identity um you weren't watching stardom when it was a single elimination tournament over one single night how do you look at it now you know, obviously, I've gone back and watched every single Cinderella that is available. I believe the first one still isn't available. And it's really cool because all those single elimination tournaments, when it was single elimination, they all took part at Cork and Hall. We made mention before really the big stardom boom a couple of years ago. Cork and Hall was where they did their main shows. I like it where it's spread out a little bit, um, as long as it's not spread out too, too far. This past tournament, this one this past year, I thought was done perfect. Where this one, Robin, this is a question I have to ask you. Obviously, you wrote a book on stardom every single show in 2021. Considering the fact that the first round happened April 10th, mm-hmm. 2021, and the final night was almost two months later, two months later in June of June 12th of 2021, literally like seven, about, yeah, I mean, let's round up eight weeks. The fact that it took two months to complete this tournament. Again, you wrote a book on 2021. How did that go, you know, for you? Did you think that it was way too long, even though that final night was a phenomenal night of wrestling? Or do you like the one-night tournament? Or do you like it where it's like two or three nights, but it's condensed a little bit more? Do you think the two months in between opening night and the crown of winner was, was too long? I think the problem that Stardom had here, yes. The short answer, yes, I feel like it is too long. The problem that you have is that initially, I think this show was supposed to be earlier on in the year. Um, I think it was supposed to be in May, I believe. So I think it was supposed to be slightly more condensed. Um, uh, even if that's wrong, which I don't think I am, um, it's still it's still too long for a tournament, especially when you have other shows where the Cinderella tournament wasn't really mentioned. Um, you sort of forget, you feel like momentum doesn't really take into account or isn't taken into account, should I say, you know. And another thing that people loved about the way that the Cinderella format was is that you could get an injury in match one and you could see wrestlers sort of fighting through that in the matches on the same night there, where obviously that was sort of taken out of it by having this two-month tournament. Of course, you still had injuries. You had Micah, who, of course, famously in the final had a very, very heavily strapped-up leg. But I do feel like it did rob a little bit of that. Personally, um, I don't particularly mind that it is spanning over more than one night. However, two months for a tournament, I feel like, is okay if every show is part of the tournament, a la the Five Star Grand Prix or the G1 Climax, for example, or even the New Japan Cup, where they have the New Japan Cup, and that is the only thing they have, whereas Stardom did... A Cinderella show, then had a couple of house shows, then did another round, then had more house shows. I mean, we had a month between round one and round two, you know, over a month between round one and round two, and then another month or two days shy of it between the second round and the final. Now, obviously, um, 
as I said, I believe Tokyo Dream Cinderella, which is where the final took place. I believe that that was supposed to take place earlier, but even so, I still think it's too... You sort of lose investment in the wrestlers, don't you? Yeah, yeah, because eventually it kind of loses its steam. And we've seen these five-star Grand Prix shows where they're at the tournaments where they're a little bit long. Obviously, this year it's only three weeks, and they're going to cram a lot of phenomenal wrestling in three weeks. But sometimes it goes a little bit too long. It's one thing, it's just like, okay, night one, night two, you have all five-star matches. Then you get to like night five, night six, where there's like one or two five-star matches. Then kind of like, what's the point? You kind of you kind of need to find your happy medium. And that's what I think what they're going to do with this year's five-star tournament. But yeah, considering the fact that this, it, this took two months and it's a single elimination tournament to get done, yeah, it went maybe just a little bit too long. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, let's sort of look, however, at the tournament as a whole. So in terms of entrance, we had Azumi, Goki can death, or Fuki can death, as she would soon be rechristened, Julia, Himika, Hanan, um, Konami, Mika, Mai Wibitani, Mina Shirakawa, Momo Watanabe, Nats Katora, Natsupoi, Ruaka, Saki Kashima, Sayaka Matani, who as we know would go on to win the tournament, Starlight Kid, Siori Tam Nakano, Unagi Sayaka, and Utami Hayashishta. It was the largest tournament field um, in Cinderella tournament history. Um, but Sayaka Matani was drawn against Tam Nakano, um, and this was on April 10th in Karakuen Hall, defeated Tam at 5 minutes and 48 seconds via over-the-top rope elimination. Matt Turner, what did you think of this match? Now, for anybody that's been listening to the Stardom cast a long time, first of all, we thank you for your support, but you know whenever it comes to a Cinderella-style match with the over-the-top rope and the faster time limit, whenever I give my Stardom scale rating, I grade it on a curve just because of those reasons. I thought this was great. Obviously, these two will eventually, when Saya does get her wish, they will meet for the Wonder of Stardom Championship, which Tam prevails, and then Saya gets her rematch at the end of the year, and then they have another rematch at um, night two of World Climax in 2022. These two wrestlers have great chemistry together. They are fantastic together. We hope that we see them somewhere down the line in a big-time match. Presumably, Saya is going to be crowned Red Belt Champion somewhere down the line. Saya versus Tam, big main event. Yes, please. I think it will draw a lot of tickets. This was really good. It was high-paced, high-intensity. They did a great job teasing the over-the-top rope very early on in the match. And then that finish was just insane where, like, Tam is trying to kick Saya. Saya's on the apron. She's trying to kick her off, kick her off, kick her off to give her over the top rope. The Cork and Hall crowd is really, really loud. Tam decides to get a uh, head of steam. She runs at Saya, and then Saya springboards off to the top rope and then is able to catch Tam, who is in the ring with a Hurricanrana all the way to the floor. I thought, again, you had less than six minutes. You told a good story. You were high-paced, high-intensity, and then just what's one of the most insane over-the-top rope eliminations I have ever seen. Just goes to show you how extremely talented Sai Kamatani is. Really great way to start this match, considering the fact that uh, you are having the newly christened Wonder of Stardom champion champion eliminated in the first round. Because remember, Tam did win this belt about a month earlier at the uh, Budokan Hall against Julia. A really great match. A great way to set Saya up for this tournament run. Um, three and three fourth stars for me, sir. Yeah, I gave it three and a quarter. Obviously, you know sub six minutes this is sort of the joy of what the cinderella tournament brings you have got these high impact high paced matches sort of condensed into a shorter time span but you've also got that added drama of the over the top rope elimination which like you've already said matt sire and tam teased really really well it did sort of highlight the athleticism that sire was able to showcase and that um, Hurricane Rana to the outside to eventually eliminate Tam was incredible and then we had that sort of stare off that iconic stare off between the two that sort of hinted that uh, that things were not finished by any stretch of the imagination I just want to clarify why I said earlier um, I have just googled it night two was postponed due to the government announcing the state of emergency for Tokyo lasting from April 25th until May 11th so it was actually a 
originally supposed to take place over two nights, not over the three. Um, and then it was rescheduled again because the semifinals and finals were supposed to be taking place on May 29th. But the extension of that state of emergency postponed the third night to June 12th. So everything we just said about the fact that two months is too long, Stardom would tend to agree. It's just that they had no choice, unfortunately, due to uh, COVID and so forth. So Saika Matani moved into the next round where she would face Starlight Kid a month later. Um, uh, and she would defeat Starlight Kid seven minutes and five seconds with a roll-up reversal. And Matt, this was easily match of the round i remember loving this match at the time because again yeah. these two really worked that high speed style so so well and they complemented each other so so well whereas sire and tam worked a lot of the drama surrounding the over the top rope elimination these two relied on just sheer pace and sheer reversals and i think that worked really really well developing drama in a completely different way we've seen since that these two have really 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 good chemistry together and i think this match was another indication of how well they work together the fact there were so many near falls they packed so much action and so many stories and the fact they did this in just over seven minutes Go to show you how insanely talented these two are. And considering the fact of how good this match is, the next year at the Five Star Grand Prix, they have a better match. And then if you rewind a few, about a month earlier than that, they have, in my opinion, the best Starlight Kid match I've ever seen uh, with Saya Kamatani defending the Wonder of Stardom Championship against Starlight Kid. It just goes to show you what great chemistry these two have together. Again, back and forth action, nonstop. Starlight Kid hits the first real big move of the match with that slice spread number two. She tries to go for a spin kick, but uh, Saya Kamatani is able to stop the spin kick, hits a Northern Light suplex for two count. Saya starts, goes for the Star Crusher. Starlight Kid rolls through the Star Crusher with a two count. Saya Kamatani comes up with a big pump kick. Um, Saya Kamatani is really getting, building momentum. But Starlight Kid uses the Momo Latch, the same move she would use a year later in the five-star defeat Saya Kamatani for a two-count. But eventually, she rolls through the Momo Latch and is able to use Starlight Kid's own momentum against her, basically almost using Saya's height, her height, you know, leverage on the Starlight Kid for the three-count. Again, great match. The fact they got all this, I was like, that was only seven minutes? That was insane because it was like, blink and you'll miss it. And again, it wasn't just spot for the sake of spot. There was storytelling in there. There was selling. There was certain things that they were going for. Again, four and a quarter stars for me. I thought this was terrific. And um, it's really cool to see that Saya, each and every one of these opponents we're talking about, that she when she eventually wins the white belt, all matches that she goes and revisits and all matches that the matches for the white belt were actually better than these four matches for the uh, Cinderella tournament win. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, this sort of... It's quite funny looking back on it, isn't it? Because obviously, as we record, Sayaka Matani is the high-speed champion. And even back in 2021, she was very au fait with the high-speed style. And when she's wrestling someone who is as good in that style as Starlight Kid is, it really does become this melting pot of high-speed goodness. And that's what this was. There was so many nearfalls. There was so many reversals. And both women just launching everything that they possibly could at each other to try and get that victory. And again, when you've got that in your arsenal, you don't necessarily have to rely on the surprise or the drama of an over-the-top rope um, elimination when you've got roll-up reversals galore. You've got all sorts of pace and things to go alongside it. I thought this was one of... Um, the best matches of the entire tournament, never mind just this round. It was certainly match of the round on the 14th of May, but for me, it was certainly one of the matches of the tournament and one that doesn't get talked about because of the next two matches in Saya's run, the semi-final and the final against Himika and Micah. But I do I do have a certain, a certain uh, fondness for this match. And I remember looking back on it when I was writing Living the Dream that uh, this match was certainly one of the matches of the tournament. And uh, yeah, if you haven't already watched this tournament, I do encourage you to go and watch it. Um, this does, however, I gave it four stars, just in case you are wondering. Um, this means that Saya moved on 
to the semi-finals and finals. As I've already mentioned, this was originally scheduled for May 29th, ended up being changed to the 12th of June, Tokyo, uh, sorry, Tokyo Dream Cinderella Special Edition, which you will hopefully remember was main evented by that tremendous red belt match uh, between Utami and Suri. Um, alongside... Saya Kamatani making their way through to the semi-finals were Himika, Micah, and Unagi Sayaka. Unagi getting perhaps the uh, the shock result of the entire tournament by eliminating Suri in the second round, um, which was quite a shock to uh, to everyone, I feel. However, Saya would move on to take on Himika in the semi-finals. Match three, Saya Kamatani defeated Himika in 8 minutes and 51 seconds, pinning her with the Star Crusher in 8 minutes and 51 seconds. I know I said that twice, but there we are. Matt, I will never not be impressed with Saya managing to get Himika up for the Star Crusher because just with her height, that's a really, really difficult move to pull off as flawlessly as Saya did. Yeah, this was great. This was my favorite match, not only from the Sire run, but from this entire tournament in 2021. This was oh. absolutely terrific. And she, yes, I mean, it just goes... And again, the fact that she wrestles Micah in the finals, which is the more lauded match for obvious reasons. It's the finals. Micah and Sire still have this storyline that they're, they're still telling, you know, generation rivals and will probably for years to come. But this was my... I enjoyed this Himika match a little bit better than I enjoyed the Micah match. These two have really good chemistry together and considering the fact they have completely different styles it just goes to show you how great Himmick is and how great Sayakamitani is that they can work with the high flyers they can work with the powerhouses they can work with the high speed wrestlers the technical wrestlers the brawlers this goes to show you how well these two work together sometimes styles make fights you have the hard hitting style that is Himika versus the high flying high intense offense style that is Sayakamitani and these two they just work together they just work so well together but you see uh, they get the fast paced start between the two of them where Himika is just trying to shoulder tackle Sayakamitani out of her boots um Say hits the drop kick for the early advantage Himika early in the match it starts to uh, get the advantage with some of her strikes and clothesline she tries to dump Sayakamitani over the top rope but Say using that athleticism to hit a springboard back into the ring which I thought was really cool because the psychology is I need to get off this apron because I can lose the match here and I do not want to uh, you know get out of here but um, eventually though Saya Kam excuse me Himika slows down Saya with a half Boston Crab. She eventually turns that into the JP Coaster for a two count. Um, I thought that was a really, really cool falsy form trade-off, which Sai Kamatani does hold her own against the bigger and strong or stronger uh, Jumbo Princess. Um, but eventually Himika gets the advantage with that, with a pair of Lariats for a two count. But eventually Sai Kamatani hits this beautiful springboard high cross body that not only gets her a two count, but opens up the door for her to hit that Star Crusher. Again, I absolutely love this match. These two work so well together. Four and a quarter stars for me. Again, we talked about Sire and Starlight Kid working together well because they both have that high-speed offense, whereas here, Himika was that huge force that Sire could work around, and that's another reason that this match was tremendous. You've got Himika, who is so power-based and is able to launch Saya Kamatani around, and then you've got Saya doing all of these incredible moves around Himika. I feel like that is a reason why these two work well together and also why Saya and Micah work so well later on in the card. It's not quite my favourite match. I gave this one four stars as well, simply because of all the history between Saya and Micah and obviously with the introduction of the Phoenix Splash, which uh, obviously is so synonymous with Saya at this point. It is nice though, Matt, to look back on Himika and think, it would have been so nice just to see her maybe have a run with the white belt or maybe get that victory in the Cinderella tournament because she did feel like someone, you know, it wrote itself. She's called the Jumbo Princess. Give her a crown. Look at that. 
Unfortunately, though, obviously she did have to retire, and that would mean that Saya Camatoni would move on to face her generational rival, Micah, in the tournament final after Micah dispensed with Unagi Sayaka in eight minutes and five seconds. Um, in this match, obviously, Saya and Micah have a long and storied history and one that has carried on into modern day stardom, but as recently as February, when Micah defeated Saya in one of her red belt defenses. However, here they had feuded quite quite a lot over the future of stardom championship and even then they was they were sort of seen as part of this golden generation together saya hadn't beaten micah one-on-one and this was her big chance and before this match and saw the build-up actually to her rutami match in march she'd spoken about wanting to put more adapt more and sort of put more moves into her offense and sort of tease that something was coming at the end of this match because it felt that with the history, the star crusher that had put Himika away wasn't necessarily going to be enough to put Micah away. And that would prove to be the case as Sayaka Matani defeated Micah in 15 minutes and five seconds with the Phoenix splash. Um, uh, and again, Matt, this for me was the match of the tournament. This was a tremendous final, a really, really good focus on the future of stardom. And the future after this tournament final really did feel bright, my friend. Yeah, I had this one at four stars. Again, I like the Himika match just a little bit better. I completely see your point. You know, wrestling subjective, but all these matches are so good that you can really order them any way that you want. But yeah, obviously... We see the future of stardom. Again, this tournament happened three years ago. You're looking where everybody's at now. Sai Kamatani allegedly rumored. Well, we've had the rumor basically told to us. Um, Sai was supposed to win the five-star Grand Prix this past year. Obviously, it didn't happen. Or excuse me, last year, that didn't happen because of the injury. Micah goes to the finals, but eventually she does defeat Suzu Suzuki to win the vacant World of Stardom Championship. Again, as this recording, Micah is the Red Belt Champion. She's doing a phenomenal job as the World of Stardom Champion. Sayaka Matani, again, the phenomenal run with the Wonder of Stardom Championship. The current high-speed champion, also just coming off a little bit of a run with Utami Hayasista as the Goddess of Stardom Tag Team Championship and is somebody that a lot of people have pegged to win this year's five-star Grand Prix. So, yeah, you legit have the future of stardom right here in the finals of this match. And then this match eventually leads into that instant classic with Shuri and Utami. So what a great one-two punch for stardom to uh, have here. Yeah, terrific match. These two, very much like Sai and Himika, they don't miss. They don't miss. And their their match a year later for the Wonder of Stardom Championship um, in May of 2022 is a phenomenal match and then Micah had another great match with Sayaka Matani back at the anniversary show in Nagoya at the Supreme Fight show this past year um, or earlier this year for, for you know again for 2024 so these two just absolutely don't miss and I got a feeling that we're going to see a lot of Saya and Micah over the next course two three four five years and this really was kind of their first big match their first big moment semi-main event tournament final to crown the next Cinderella win. But yeah, Sai Kamatani gets the match done with the Phoenix Splash. And I do like how Sai builds up each. He has a, she has a better finisher for each match. With Tam, it's over the top rope. With Starlight Kid, it's reversing the Momo Latch. With Himika, it's her secondary finisher, the Star Crusher, where here it's her ultimate finisher, the Phoenix Splash that does in uh, the Empress in Micah. Great match, four stars, great way to end this fantastic uh, run of the Cinderella tournament and giving Saya the big, you know, basically the launching point of her career. And that's something that's a key difference between the Cinderella tournament and the five-star Grand Prix. You've, I feel like, especially in recent years, the Cinderella tournament has been a jumping off point for a lot of wrestlers who are almost there but need that final push. We saw it with Momo Watanabe, for example, with Hannon most recently and with Mirai those wrestlers that sort of are upper mid-card or mid-card but need that extra push, need that extra exposure. And I think Saya Kamatani was on the precipice of breaking into that main event scene, obviously having just 
um, gone for the red belt against Utami and Nippon Budokan. And I feel like this, as she stood in the green dress, the silver confetti falling, this was the moment that Sayaka Amatani really came out and became a prominent member of that stardom main event scene. Fantastic match against Micah. To this day, one of my favorite Cinderella finals. And I think this run from Saya is up there as one of the best single tournament runs. In fact, I'd have argued that it was the best single tournament run aside from Hannon this year, which I think just about pips it in my eyes. Um, what about you? I'm intrigued to know where this place is in terms of single tournament runs. Where does this place? Because for me, there's there's two. There's the Sire and the Hannon. And I think Hannon's just pips it. Maybe in terms of match quality, maybe in terms of underdog, I don't know. But there's something about the Hannon one that really just resonated with me slightly more than the Saya Kamatani one. I see your point. The Saya is number one for me, even though it's a little... I mean, Arissa you can put up there because it's different because it's it's one night tournament, mm-hmm. but I like how the Cinderella tournament, at least you get, at least the winner has to win two matches on the final night. I know some years it was three, some years it was four. I like how we're breaking up the tournament, but you have to win two matches on the final night. Now, the reason why I say Saya over Han, and maybe it's not fair, is because you look where Saya Kamatani eventually does with the Cinderella win. Eventually, she does get back to the white belt and again has that 480 day run as the Wonder of Stardom champion, where Hanan was unsuccessful, and very much like Saya, Saya was unsuccessful on her wish. She was unsuccessful with Soriano, but maybe seeing where this Cinderella win in 2024 is going to launch Hanan in the next year, year and a half, two years. But just looking at this run, match quality, opponents, and where Saya Kamatani is from, or was from 2021 to where she is now. That's the reason why I edge Sai Kamatani and having the greatest Cinderella one run of all time. But yeah, I have her number one, Han and number two, and Arissa at number three. And considering the fact they're kind of three different tournaments and three different outlooks, it's really just a cool conversation that we can have. Yeah, I can completely see your point. Obviously, we need to wait to see what's going to happen with Hannon in the future. Of course, as we're talking, she's, you know, blowing people away as part of that tag team with Sayurida as Wingori. And as a singles competitor, that match with Sayoriano at All-Star Grand Queendom, fantastic. And even if you don't achieve your wish, and we speak about it all the time on this podcast to the point where we've just recorded the Marigold Stand, and I said it about three times on there, it's not... It's not if you lose, it's how you lose. And I think Hannon really gave a fantastic account of herself in that All-Star Grand Queendom match. Obviously, I do feel like she's going to be the the future ace of stardom. When that will be, I don't know. And obviously, then maybe we can discuss the jumping off points for both Sire and Hannon. Maybe it'll be a future Patreon episode, I don't know. Um, in terms of Sire Kamatani, um, she would obviously lose... Her match, which was her wish, she had a match against Tam Nakano in Yokohama in July, would ultimately lose that match, would then manage to get another opportunity at the White Belt and at Tam um, uh, at the Dream Queendom show at Sumo Hall and would eventually usurp Tam, as Matt said, to embark on a record-breaking 480-day reign with the White Belt, which to this day remains the second longest White Belt reign in history and uh, is the most successful in terms of title defences. And if you look at that run, in terms of match quality, um, I'd say it's, I'd argue it's unrivaled in terms of match quality with perhaps Momo Watanabe is a close, close second. But it all starts with this Cinderella run, doesn't it, Matt? Because until that point, like I, like I mentioned, when it was announced that Stardom were looking to the future and then doubled down on that by announcing Sire in the, um, the Red Belt match at Budokan, I feel like it was still quite a surprise that she was in that position. However, after winning the Cinderella it did sort of feel more right that she was in that main event scene. And I feel like that in itself is what the Cinderella tournament is about more than winning the championship. Do you agree? 
Yeah, yeah, and eventually she looks like she's going to get there. But uh, considering the fact that, yeah, at that Budokan Hall show, it's like they kind of just shoehorned Sai and Utami in there, and they absolutely hit it out of the park. And I know for a lot of people that have been watching Stardom, you know, live as it happened a couple months before I did, obviously, you know, you, um, they would say this was really kind of the launching point. for That match was really the building blocks for Saya, where this tournament win was really what basically made her as somebody that can test the main event waters from time to time. But like, yeah, we can put her in a main event whenever she wants. It's going to be a great match. It's going to deliver. The match is going to get over. It's going to draw money. Her opponent's going to get over. And it's, you know, Sai Kamatani really is, you know, like I said, kind of says on her video wall, the future. And the future uh, has been for the last few years for the Golden Phoenix. Absolutely. It's, it's a it's sort of to sign this off, the 2021 Cinderella tournament. Even despite, you know, the sort of divisive nature of its structure and things like that is the perfect illustration of what this tournament can do for a person. Um, uh, you know, Sire was sort of on the precipice, wins this tournament and is thrust into that main event and feels like she belongs and has proved herself to be worthy of that shot. And for me, that is the whole point of the Cinderella. And that is actually what makes the Cinderella tournament special, not its structure or not the fact that it's a single nine, not the fact that it's a 10-minute time limit and not the fact that it's an over-the-top rope um, elimination. It's what it does for the winner and the sort of standard of winners as well and what they've gone on to achieve Momo Watanabe, Mayu Iwatani Tony Storm of course a famous winner of it, Arissa as you mentioned Julia in 2020 um, it's what it's done for those women more than the tournament structure and I think Sire is perhaps the best illustration of what this tournament can do um, but that being said Matt Turner that draws us to an end of a rather short episode of the Stardom Gas only four matches to review but it's four of potentially the most important matches in the short career of Saya Kamatani thus far thank you so much to everyone for listening we hope you enjoyed this delve into stardom history and Matt Turner I don't know if we've discussed and if we have I have forgotten and I apologize what are we going to be looking at next month in our uh, in our little retrospectives in our new retrospective that we haven't released from the patreon well as far i don't know what we're going to release from the patreon that i'm not sure yet but as far as the retrospective that me and you will record for the month of july it's something that as soon as i pitched you you said you were super excited about since it just seems like Sayakamatani and Mina Shirakawa are ah, yes, basically on the tip of the tongue <laughs> of uh, of uh, of a lot of People, especially in the stardom world, obviously with Mina, all of her appearances on AEW TV and the fact that uh, there was this past weekend she did wrestle at the Forbidden Door pay-per-view. And obviously, Saya Kamatani is somebody that, um, again, I really think they have really big plans for. Uh, obviously, we will talk about that later. Or again, by the time this uh, this episode drops, you have already heard what I think the big plans are for Saya Kamatani. We're going to be looking back at four matches between Mina Shirakawa and Saya Kamatani. We will be starting with match number one, will be Mina Shirakawa and Sai Kamatani from the 2022 Five Star Grand Prix. And then we'll be going to um, what the, even Sonny said. We, it was an absolute perfect match until the finish. We will go to the Wonder of Stardom Championship match, the match where Sai Kamatani, uh, excuse me, Mina Shirakawa gets injured on the Mist Phoenix Splash. Then we will go to match number three, All Star Grand Queendom from last year. Mina Shirakawa finally winning the Wonder of Stardom Championship against Sai and match number four, just because I want to watch it again and I want to kind of get it your review on it. It's a matchup that me and you were both there live for as Mina Shirakawa team with May Sierra and Micah to take on the team of Sai Kamatani, Azumi, and Tam Nakano from Super Card of Honor in Philadelphia. So we'll be looking at, at those four matches, basically kind of just the rivalry that is Sai Kamatani and Mina Shirakawa. Because I think it's a rivalry that I don't think people talk about enough because these matches are all really terrific and uh, all basically a feud or rivalry that I think stardom can really draw on you know as we're getting towards uh, the uh, end of this year and a few months and then the beginning of next year so some Mina versus Sia Love right here on our retrospective on the stardom cast 
And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. If you think we've deserved it, a five-star review on the podcast app of your choice goes a hell of a long way to helping us out. It really, really does. We're already keeping some really cool company uh, in the podcast charts in different companies, which is uh, it's always really quite humbling to see. So thank you for that. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash the Stardom Cast, where you can get all of our episodes early and ad-free for as little as one. One dollar a month. And um, you can find us on YouTube at the Stardom Cast and all other social media at the Stardom Cast as well. Don't forget to check out the website www.thestardomcast.com for all of your archived episodes, Stardom stats, including a breakdown of all of the Cinderella tournaments and five star Grand Prix and all of that good stuff as well. Um, uh, and yeah, if you want to talk to me on Twitter, you can at Real Rob Goodwin, Matt Turner. Where can they find you and sign us off, my friend? Yes, questions, comments, suggestions, anything you need from me, Matt Turner, OF, on the Instagram and or the Twitter is the best way to get a hold of me. Obviously, you can shoot me an email. The email address is thestardomcast22 at gmail.com. And, folks, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the all the bonus content that myself and Rob Goodwin are dropping. Um, we, you know, there's a lot of really, really good content on the Stardom Cast feed. So I hope you're enjoying it. Hope you uh, you keep keep helping us out with some five star reviews and shares and likes and retweets that you know anything and everything helps us out because like I always say it's just not my podcast it's our podcast because we're all together and everybody's different everyone's special 